Hello to chapter 9 of From the Earth to the Moon by Jules Verne in a translation by Louis Mercier and Eleanor E. King. And this chapter is titled The Question of the Powders. There remained for consideration merely the question of powders. The public awaited with interest its final decision. The size of the projectile, the length of the cannon being settled, what would be the quantity of powder necessary to produce impulsion? It is generally asserted that gunpowder was invented in the 14th century by the monk Schwartz, who paid for his grand discovery with his life. It is, however, pretty well proved that this story ought to be ranked among the legends of the Middle Ages. Gunpowder was not invented by anyone. It was the lineal successor of the Greek fire, which, like itself, was composed of sulfur and salpeter. Few persons are acquainted with the mechanical power of gunpowder. Now, this is precisely what is necessary to be understood in order to comprehend the importance of the question submitted to the committee. A liter of gunpowder weighs about two pounds. During combustion, it produces 400 liters of gas. This gas, on being liberated and acted upon by temperature raised to 2,400 degrees, occupies a space of 4,000 liters. Consequently, the volume of powder is to the volume of gas produced by its combustion as 1 to 4,000. One may judge, therefore, of the tremendous pressure on this gas when compressed within a space 4,000 times too confined. All this was, of course, well known to the members of the committee when they met on the following evening. The first speaker on this occasion was Major Elphinstone, who had been the director of the gunpowder factories during the war. Gentlemen, said this distinguished chemist, I begin with some figures which will serve as the basis of our calculation. The old 24-pounder shot required for its discharge 16 pounds of powder. You are certain of this amount? broke in Barbicane. Quite certain, replied the major. The Armstrong cannon employs only 75 pounds of powder for a projectile of 800 pounds and the Rodman Columbia uses only 160 pounds of powder to send its half-ton shot a distance of six miles. These facts cannot be called in question, for I myself raised the point during the depositions taken before the Committee of Artillery. Quite true, said the general. Well, replied the major, these figures go to prove that the quantity of powder is not increased with the weight of the shot. That is to say, if a 24-pounder shot requires 16 pounds of powder, in other words, if in ordinary guns we employ a quantity of powder equal to two-thirds of the weight of the projectile, this proportion is not constant. Calculate and you will see that in place of 333 pounds of powder, the quantity is reduced to no more than 160 pounds. What are you aiming at? asked the president. If you push your theory to extremes, my dear major, said J.T. Marston, you will get to this. As soon as your shot becomes sufficiently heavy, you will not require any powder at all. Our friend Marston is always at his jokes, even in serious matters, cried the major. But let him make his mind easy. I am going presently to propose gunpowder enough to satisfy his artillerists. 
propensities, I only keep to statistical facts when I say that during the war and for the very largest guns the weight of the powder was reduced as the result of experience to a tenth part of the weight of the shot. Perfectly correct, said Morgan. But before deciding the quantity of powder necessary to give the impulse, I think it would be as well. We shall have to employ a large grained powder, continued the major. Its combustion is more rapid than all, than, than, than the one of the small. No doubt about that, replied Morgan. But it is very destructive and ends by enlarging the bore of the pieces. Granted, but that which is injurious to a gun destined to perform long service is not so to our Columbiad. We shall run no danger of an explosion, and it is necessary that our powder should take fire instantaneously in order that its mechanical effect may be complete. We must have, said Marston, several touch holes so as to fire it at different points at the same time. Certainly, replied Elphinstone, but that will render the working of the piece more difficult. I return then to my large grained powder which removes those difficulties. In his Columbia charges, Rotman employed a powder as large as chestnuts made of willow charcoal simply dried in cast iron pans. This powder was hard and glittering, left no trace upon the hand, contained hydrogen and oxygen in large proportions, took fire instantaneously, and though very destructive, did not sensibly injure the mouthpiece. Up to this point, Barbicane had kept aloof from the discussion. He left the others to speak while he himself listened. He had evidently got an idea. He now simply said, Well, my friends, what quantity of powder do you propose? The three members looked at one another. Two hundred thousand pounds, at last, said Morgan. Five hundred thousand, added the major. Eight hundred thousand, screamed Marston. A moment of silence followed this triple proposal. It was at last broken by the president. Gentlemen, he quietly said, I start from this principle that the resistance of a gun constructed under the given conditions is unlimited. I shall surprise our friend Marston then by stigmatizing his calculations as timid, and I propose to double his 800,000 pounds of powder. Sixteen hundred thousand pounds, shouted Marston, leaping from his seat. Just so. We shall have to come then to my ideal of a cannon half a mile long. For you see, sixteen hundred thousand pounds will occupy a space of about twenty thousand cubic feet. And since the contents of your cannon do not exceed forty-five thousand cubic feet, it would be half full. And the bore will not be more than long enough for the gas to communicate to the projectile sufficient impulse. Nevertheless, said the president, I hold to that quantity of powder. Now, 1,600,000 pounds of powder will create 6 billion liters of gas. 6,000 millions. You quite understand. What is to be done then, said the general. The thing is very simple. We must reduce this enormous quantity of powder while preserving to it its mechanical power. Good, but by what means? I'm going to tell you, replied Barbicane quietly. Nothing is more easy than to reduce this mass to one quarter of its bulk. You know that curious cellular matter which constitutes the elementary tissues of vegetable? This substance is found quite pure in many bodies, especially in cotton, which is nothing more than the down of the seeds of the cotton plant. 
Now cotton, combined with cold nitric acid, become transformed into a substance eminently insoluble, combustible and explosive. It was first discovered in 1832 by Braconneau, a French chemist who called it xylodyne. In 1838, another Frenchman, Pelaus, investigated its different pro properties and finally, in 1846, Sconbein, professor of chemistry at Bale, proposed its employment for purposes of war. This powder, now called pyroxyle, or fulminating cotton is prepared with great facility by simply plunging cotton for 15 minutes in nitric acid, then washing it in water, then drying it, and it is ready for use. Nothing could be more simple, said Morgan. Moreover, pyroxyle is unaltered by moisture, a valuable property to us inasmuch as it would take several days to charge the cannon. It ignites at 170 degrees in place of 240, and its combustion is so rapid that one may set light to it on the top of the ordinary powder without the latter having time to ignite. Perfect, exclaimed the Major. Only it is more expensive. What matter? cried J.T. Marston. Finally, it imparts to projectiles a velocity four times superior to that of gunpowder. It will even add that if we mix it with one-eighth of its own weight of nitrate of potassium, its expansive force is again considerably augmented. Will that be necessary? asked the Major. I think not, replied Barbicane. So then, in place of 1,600,000 pounds of powder, we shall have but 400,000 pounds of fulminating cotton. And since we can, without danger, compress four, 500 pounds of cotton into 27 cubic feet, the whole quantity will not occupy a height of more than 100, 180 feet within the bore of the Columbiad. In this way, the shot will have more than 700 feet of bore to traverse under a force of 6 billion liters of gas before taking its flight toward the moon. At this juncture, J.T. Marston could not repress his emotion. He flung himself into the arms of his friend with the violence of a projectile, and Barbicane would have been stove in if he had not been boom-proof. This incident terminated the third meeting of the committee. Barbicane and his bold colleagues, to whom nothing seemed impossible, had succeeded in solving the complex problems of projectile, cannon and powder. Their plan was drawn up and it only remained to put it into execution. A mere matter of detail, a bagatelle, said J.T. Marston. So... That was chapter 9. Bye-bye till next time with chapter 10, which is titled One Enemy versus 25 Millions of Friends. <laughs>